My name is Mercedes. I am a survivor of domestic abuse. Today, I am breaking my silence. Mercedes, how old were you when you met your first perpetrator? So, I was 18. I was, I knew him from like mutual friends and whatnot. And he kind of knew my background, that I was the black sheep of the family and he kind of resonated with me on that point. So he wanted to get his own place. So we basically teamed up and moved in together, like very, very quickly. And that's how our relationship started. And was it obvious that he was abusive? Was there any kind of obvious signs of emotional abuse, mental abuse, physical abuse? Because 18's young, right? Yeah, I pretty much moved in with him straight away. Just quickly realised he was an alcoholic and that's the physical abuse started pretty much straight away. So by 10 o'clock in the morning, he would have like a crate of beers and then by midday, he would start to be aggressive and abusive. What was it like to live around it? So it was something I never really truly experienced before. So it was a bit of a shock, but because of his family background of seeing his granddad abuse his grandma and not having a male figure in his life, I just kind of blamed it on his um, past circumstances. And I just thought, I just felt sorry for him until the point where the abuse got so bad. There was one incident where he got so controlling, he only let me have one earphone in while he was playing his game. And because I put both in, because I couldn't hear the thing I was watching, he pinned me down and bit my face up and bit my neck up, like really pinned me down. And the moment he got up, he just laughed and said, well, you deserve that for not doing as you're told. And it was that point when his mum and his nan came over. And even though he made me put makeup on and I tried to cover the bruises, they, they weren't covering. And when his mum asked how the bruises were, he just laughed saying, well, she deserved them because she weren't doing as she was told. And they just kind of sat there and didn't say anything. And that's when I know, right, I, I need to leave because, you know, this, this ain't right, this is, you know, I'm not gonna get any support from staying in this. And at 18, so young, where did you go for help? Did you know where to turn to for help? No, I was begging my family to come back home, which they didn't want me back home. So it just got to a point where I had to literally pack a bag, whatever I could while he was away, and just flee to somewhere where I thought that was gonna be safe. But where was safe? Because if you didn't have the support from your family, where do you go? That's what led me to my next abusive relationship. So I fled that situation and managed to live with my next perpetrator who got me pregnant very, very quickly on. I weren't in the right frame of mind to have a child. I was out every weekend getting drunk, you know, trying to black out from everything that had happened to me. So when I found out I was pregnant, my first initial reaction was, well, I'm not ready to be a mum, I don't want to be a mum. But it was drilled in my head of, oh, I'm ready to be a dad, I want us to be a family, you're the love of my life. They just completely love-bombed me to the point where I had to make myself believe that I was ready for a kid that I wasn't ready for. So there was a lot of coercion around you going through the pregnancy and having a child with him. Yeah, everything was lovely until the day of the scan when we found out we was having a little girl and his face just completely changed where he was disgusted. He asked, oh, when can we go? Or oh, actually, I'm not ready to be a dad now. Now we're having a little girl. So that left me a bit shell-shocked. So when I was looking at avenues of whether I wanted to keep my child or not, that's when he was being controlling by saying, oh no, I'm allowed a blip, you're not, I am. And then that's when he was really controlling towards me where he would hide me, I weren't allowed to see my friends anymore. And he wouldn't post me because he would say I'm a fat mess and I'm, he's lucky that I'm, you know, he's with someone like me and it just escalated from there. What did that do to your self esteem? It just completely ruined me because I saw other people flourishing in their pregnancies, having a partner that would be with them throughout labour while I was in labour all by myself for the whole week. I was told by doctors that because I had preeclampsia that me and my baby could die. And he didn't care, he didn't bother coming to the hospital until the very last minute where he just sat on my laptop playing games while I was in pain. And then while I had my emergency C-section, he just 
got up and left because it was hurting his back and he couldn't be bothered with it. So I pretty much struggled throughout that point, but it hurt the most when I got home after having a C-section and I weren't even allowed back in my own bed. I had to sleep on the sofa because he didn't want me and our daughter disturbing his sleep and his well-being was better than mine and our daughter's. So what did survival look like in this period of being a new mum with a newborn, having zero comfort, zero support, zero safety? It was hard because I was already very isolated from my family and friends. He was then financially controlling where I remember having my last £10 for my baby's milk because I weren't able to breastfeed. He went out, took the £10, I didn't see him for hours and hours until he finally came back at night with a bag full of chocolate for himself. At this point, obviously, my daughter's crying for some milk and he says, well, I need to eat, fuck her. I don't give a shit, that's your problem. Obviously, when I got upset about it, that's when he'd shout at me, saying, well, you're the bad mum, you know, you know, deal with it kind of thing. And then he would just say, you're fat mess, you're lucky I'm with you. No wonder you've not got any friends, no wonder your family don't like you. And he was just completely horrible. How did this affect your um, space to parent? It made it really difficult because he would always kind of draw in the like draw in that I came from a broken home and that I was the black sheep in my family. So I needed him in order for my daughter to have a family and that I couldn't be a family without him. And every time I tried to leave him or stood my ground, it was always kind of hammered to me as how, no, I'm, I'm doing it wrong. And I just completely lost who I was, you know. He didn't like me wearing makeup. He didn't like me wearing certain clothes. I had to literally wear everything baggy. If I literally left to the shop, it would be, oh, you're such a slag, I hope he's worth it or prove you're going to the shop. And he would literally time me, he'd make me send photos, but he would then proceed to go out, leave me for days on end, cheat on me, and hack my social medias and message my friends and family pretending to, to be me, saying horrible things, just so he really had that control over me. With all these like over, forms of abuse, at what point, or if at any point, did you recognise that he was a perpetrator and that what you were being subjected to was domestic abuse? I think it got to a point where I remember feeling so broken. That's the first time I truly had suicidal thoughts where I was prepared to leave my daughter because I just saw it as this was my life. He kept saying to me how I was baggage and that no one would want me now, especially as a fat mess with a, with, a, with a daughter, no one would want me. So that's when I knew I needed to leave and luckily, at the time obviously I didn't think it was lucky, but when he cheated on me and left for an, another young girl, obviously at the time it really broke me, but actually that's what I needed to be able to move forward and actually try and reflect on what's happened to me and how I can move past what had happened. But I found when I did leave, he was worse. So he was controlling me through my daughter. He was refusing to pay child maintenance. He saw her on his terms unless, you know, if he knew I had something going on in my life, like work or whatnot, he would then not have us, so then that would affect my work or going out with my friends or meeting anyone else. If I tried to meet a new partner, he would make accusations that we were still together. So obviously they wouldn't want that. So you experienced extensive amounts of post-separation abuse, mm. right? Yeah. It got to the point where I, I thought I could trust his mum, where I thought I could go to his mum and say what was happening to me and there was a certain incident where when I finally put some boundaries in place and I said, no, I don't want you in my life, like, you can be in my daughter's life, but I don't want you in my life, like, I've had enough. I finally got him off the tenancy because he weren't paying the bills and he was going to leave me and my daughter um, up for eviction. 
that's when I, I knew, right, I don't, I don't want anything to do with him because he's took me for all my money, he's not paid the bills, he would happily leave me and his daughter on the streets and treat me like a piece of crap. So that night he managed to break my back door. He already threw ice cream at my window at that point um, in the morning while I was away. He managed to break my back door, storm through my house, and he grabbed a kitchen knife and he was waving it in my face, saying, oh, you're lucky this, this ain't for you and I'm gonna kill whoever, whoever you love, I'm gonna kill and I'm gonna F them up. And then my first reaction, because my daughter was only two at the time, so she was seeing this and she was screaming. My first reaction was, right, it wasn't even about protecting me, it was about protecting my daughter. So I pushed my daughter into the downstairs toilet, shut the door, and then somehow I managed to push him out the door, but at this point he started cutting his wrists and he was saying, well, I'm gonna kill myself and my blood's gonna be on your hands and you're gonna have to explain to our daughter why she ain't got a dad because of you. I don't know where my strength came from, but I managed to push him out the door with the knife, hold the door, and for some reason, I didn't even ring the police first. I rang his dad, because his dad lives across the road, and I said, get your son. He's got a knife, he's out of control, I can't deal with this. And his dad went, no, not my problem, deal with it. You've obviously provoked him. So at that point, I did call the police. And when they did come, I just felt the police was like, oh, poor you, poor you, because he played the mental health card. So I felt really, like, disheartened from the police. They didn't really do much kind of aftercare or anything with me. Luckily, social got involved and they could see right through him and see what kind of person he was. But the police didn't take action until his own brother actually reported him to the police for them to realise, oh, OK, he's probably worse than we thought he was. Mm. The way that the police um, reacted, or lack of reaction, mm. how did that make you feel as a victim who was being subjected to this violence and abuse? I just... All my life I thought, you know, the police are there for when you call them, you can put your trust in them, but actually it made me realise that actually I couldn't trust them. And the fact that they was you know, patting him on the back and rubbing his back, saying, oh, everything's going to be OK after what me and my daughter went through. Like, my daughter was even scared of my stepdad, who, like, she absolutely adored. She was scared of every single man. She was clinging on to me. She just, like, she was just, she just changed from that point. And it really angered me when I thought, you know, I'd never call the police, I'd never... I'm not an inconvenience or anything like that. And the moment I needed support, you weren't there to help me. And it weren't until social got involved and I had such a big fear of social because I was always told if you get social involved, you're not going to see your kid again. So I, I just automatically assumed, this is it now, I'm going to have my kid took off me. But because I worked with them and I was trying to better myself, that weren't the case. And they saw right through him. Even then, after the report closed, it, there was no support, there was no help or guidance. I remember just having this breakdown and finding women's aid and speaking to women's aid and then somehow I managed to come across your page and actually learning about, um, you know, gaslighting and love bombing and reactive abuse, like, it all made sense for me, but even though I had that knowledge, I didn't know how I could move forward and how I could process the trauma that I'd been through. Has the presence of a community with other survivors, other female survivors, then helped you or enabled you to recover and to heal? Yeah, definitely. It led me to find trauma therapy, which was with other groups of women who were survivors as well. So that really helped that. Every story's different, but I didn't feel so alone. And I would always compare myself to TV series where you know, the women end up dead, and I thought, well, I'm not that bad, so I'm obviously, you know, my story's not important and shouldn't be shared, when actually, because I work in mental health now, I've met so many survivors who, you know, have come out the other end and have no support, and actually just being that listening ear and knowing that I understand them and that I hear them, like, helps them a lot, and it also helps me to know that they're not alone. 
So you see firsthand, not just as a survivor, but in your career, that it's therapy and the presence of a community that has this positive impact on female survivors. Definitely. But I think it's hard to know where to look because I somehow managed to stumble across your page. And I, even to this day, I can't even remember how I found your page, but actually your page really changed my life to the point where there was a friend of mine who was in a domestic relationship and I sent her your page and that was that gave her strength to leave. And yet I felt like I had no part to play in that because all I did was send her your page. So it's like the littlest things that can help someone move forward and actually get out of that place. So what does your life look like today now that you've accessed therapy and you have the support of a community? I feel like I'm in such a better place that I feel like I needed that time by myself where I had to figure out what I liked and what I needed and wanted, where I never had any boundaries in place. I was such a given person where I wanted the best for everyone, but actually, you know, I never believed in like lost, lost causes, but some people are and if they don't want to be helped or they don't acknowledge that what they're doing is wrong, that actually you should leave them there because they're not worthy to be in your life. And me and my daughter are really happy. When I met my partner, I remember going into the relationship saying, oh, I'm just baggage and this is my life, you know, this is what I have to deal with. And he was the one that said, no, actually, this is not your life. Your life is what you make it. And you're not baggage, you're you and you and your daughter come as a pair and you will thrive with whatever you and your daughter face. And actually that's what has really pushed me forward where when he does try and control me through our daughter, I can say, no, you're not, so. You've reclaimed a lot of power and control. Definitely. How does that make you feel now, today, in this moment? Yeah, it makes me feel relieved to the point that, like, I just, I just want to put my middle finger up to him and say, Fuck you, you know, you've got nothing on me anymore. We may sh share a child through DNA, but actually, you know, you don't love and care for her as much as I do. And actually, I wanted to thrive and not grow up in that cycle of abuse that I had to endure. <laughs>